Our next speaker is Peter Morin. He's a team lead with Bell Alliance Corporate Security Group, where he is responsible for managing security planning, vulnerability assessments, security event management, and incident response. His position with Bell Alliance focuses on information security risk management, penetration testing, application code analysis, malware analysis, and developing standards for secure application development. Peter has over 15 years of in-depth information technology experience in the fields of enterprise computing and networking with an emphasis on IT security, application development, business continuity, incident response, and forensics. Prior to Bell Alliant, Peter was a senior manager with KPMG and Ernst & Young's IT security risk advisory and forensic practices. Peter is a frequent speaker on the subject of social networking, risk management, information security, penetration testing, malware analysis, and forensics. Welcome, Peter. Start anytime. All right, folks. I guess I'm I'm here to fearmonger for a little bit. I guess. Uh, so my name's Peter Morin. Um, I work for Bell Alliance. Um, I, I got the intro, but really what I do is I, I manage a team of uh, skilled folks, uh, and, and really what we do is uh, uh, we do incident response and gather intelligence for Bell Alliance across Canada. So. Uh, um, trying to detect potential intrusion and relaying intelligence information through various parts of the company and making sure that employee and, and customer data is safe is pretty much what I do there. Um, so what I want to talk to you today about is, is kind of the cyber threat um, and, and how that kind of relates to, uh, to privacy and, and some of the breaches that have involved um, the loss of data. So from a general trends perspective, uh, you know, we're seeing that targeted attacks are, are, are on the rise right now. Um, you know, we're not seeing any more uh, this, this, this whole uh, hacking for a trophy type of deal. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more challenges to what we're looking at today. Uh, you know, the, the, the skill level of these attackers is a lot stronger. Um, the, the, the backing from various organizations, uh, underground organizations, is a lot stronger, and the sharing of, of attack vectors is a lot stronger as well. Uh, and this caused us to have to really rethink how we're going to deal with security going forward. Um, and I'm a member of uh, a member in, and uh, a member of the board of a group called the High Tech Crime Investigation Association. Um, we deal with various law enforcement in the U.S., in Canada, and and, and other countries. And you know, to hear people like the FBI and, and folks from the NSA say things like, you know, that law enforcement's really to the point where they're outgunned in certain areas is, is a very scary thought. But this is the way that people are, are seeing things today. Um, and, and the attacks are for, for a very specific reason. Uh, you know, we used to see these, uh, these uh, uh, attackers would hit us because, you know, they could. They would find some opening and they would try to get in, and it was all great. They would get a trophy out of it. And, and, and they would move on. Now we're seeing that attacks are much more uh, positioned uh, and targeted towards specific organizations to potentially get specific types of data out of you. Right? Um, you know this this uh, this term of hacktivism, um, or or what we call non-monetary type attacks, is becoming more and more popular. Anybody here had heard of the group Anonymous? So again, people know who they are, um, and. I, I've been reading a lot of things lately where, you know, 
when we look at anonymous, for example, it's not really one specific person, it's a concept, right? Anybody could really be anonymous at the end of the day. But, you know, these attacks where they're not necessarily trying to steal money from you, they're trying to prove a point, um, you know, these attacks are, are more and more prevalent. Um, you know, we're seeing things like state-sponsored attacks, uh, where attacks are actually, uh, you know, positioned by various, uh, various countries that, that are looking for intelligence. And uh, really interesting, uh, you know, the Identity Theft Research Center, uh, you know, they, they uh, basically had a report that came out and saying that, uh, uh, you know, hacking was uh, the, largest, uh, the largest source of data breach in 2011. Um, there are interesting statistics, and, and it, it only goes to the things we see where I work, and some of the things I'm seeing in these various organizations that I work with. So before we kind of get into what really is going on, I'd like to kind of look at a, a year in review. Now, some of the things in this uh, kind of, they, they stem back from a little bit of the end of 2010. A lot of the breaches that occurred in 2010, for example, uh, they, weren't, uh, they weren't made public till 2011. So some of the information may seem a little old, but it is, it is relevant in this case. So, some of the uh, really interesting uh, um, surveys that are out there, uh, and I think the speaker before me mentioned the Ponymon survey, or as my kids like to say, the Pokemon survey. Uh, not necessarily the same thing, but um, in the 2010 survey that uh, was released in 2011, uh, we see things like the cost of a data breach uh, is, is rising, and, and it was the highest um, in, in the end of 2010. Um, we also see that uh, one of the spots where organizations are spending a lot of money is on uh, legal costs to avoid things like class action lawsuits. So, you know, because a lot of these attacks involve breach of data and you've got a lot of people involved in these, uh, you know, in these organizations, we're seeing that, uh, you know, legal matters are starting to crop up and, and this is a, a, a fairly large cost for organizations. Um, the average churn rates were slightly higher from last year. So, you know, this is uh, basically attacks that have caused customers to leave organizations. Uh, you know, for example, when I talk to senior management at Bell Alliance, this is one of the questions they ask me, you know, if we were to have a breach, how many customers would we lose? Um, and this is on the rise as well. You can see 3.6% in 2008 to 37 in 2009, and I'm, I'm sure in, in the 2011 survey it's going to be high as well. Uh, most, expen most expensive data breach, $31 million to resolve on the average. Now, these are U.S.-based breaches. Again, we don't have a lot of information on uh, Canadian breaches. Um, TELUS had a pretty good survey on, on this. Uh, they did a report, TELUS and Rotman School. Uh, there's a pretty good uh, um, survey on this, and if anybody's interested, they can check with me at the end of the presentation. There is some Canadian numbers in there. Um, the least expensive was around $750,000. So I don't know about you, but if I went to my leadership and said, you know, you're going to have to spend $20 million on a breach, you know, I'd be looking for a job somewhere else pretty quickly, right? Um, the 2010-2011 CSI or Computer Security Institute survey, uh, malware most common attack seen, 67.1%. And we're going to see how malware has become not just this annoyance, it's really become a, a very strong vector into getting data out of your network. How many of you here think that, uh, you know, or have experienced malware that has potentially stolen data off their computer? So we're going to see that malware is not just, you know, the annoying pop-up about antivirus, you know, those, those really annoying fake antivirus pop-ups. We're going to actually see that malware can, uh, and I'll use the term exfiltrate or offload data from your machine, and it is the most popular. 45.6% of respondents say they reported, uh, reported said they had been the subject of at least one targeted attack. So we're not talking about, oh, I just happened to have a big network, so they, you know, came across me and found me and attacked me. We're talking about an organization that's specifically targeted because of something they have that the attacker wants. And fewer respondents are, are, than ever are willing to share specific information. So um, actually telling the public or releasing information about a breach um, is, is becoming less and less uh, obvious. And groups like Anonymous love this because they like to basically show the, the world that 
you know, these organizations aren't necessarily protecting your data properly. So when I mentioned targeted, you could see here that the purple swath there, uh, can, we, can, we consider uh, basically attacks version 2.0, so more targeted attacks as, as opposed to attacks to just try and get anybody they can. Uh, and we could see that that's on the rise. 21.6% of attacks are considered targeted. Another really interesting uh, st stat from the CSI uh, uh, survey is that even though we're seeing a rise in targeted attacks, the scary thing about it is we're still seeing the same kind of, uh, the same kind of uh, reactive remediation here. So, you know, instead of trying to put in place some other controls that might be beneficial to avoiding these attacks, I'm still th seeing things like patching vulnerable software and, uh, and uh, patched or remedia remediation other vulnerable hardware or infrastructure, installed additional computer, we're throwing firewalls at things, we're patching machines. The big issue is when you put a lot of security people, are there security people out here? I don't want to insult too many people. I am one, but security mindset is throw more firewalls, put more really cool stuff, DLP and, and, and more intrusion detection and everything. The problem that you, we kind of face at times is we forget that what we're really trying to protect is the data. We, we're not necessarily trying to protect the network. We're trying to build protection, against, uh, protection for the data itself. And, and we kind of miss the boat in a lot of cases. And, and then you can see in the survey, they, they, the respondents do as well. Uh, Verizon survey, um, really another really good piece of information. Uh, whereas we saw, uh, a, you know, when I talk, do a lot of these talks, I asked the audience, I said, you know, would you assume that government, for example, is going to be highly targeted? Oh, I got to go after government secrets or I, I have to, like, you know, break into Lockheed Martin or Grumman or one of these defense contractors. From a privacy perspective or from a data perspective, what the attackers are going for are organizations that have an abundance of data and possibly lack security controls. So we can see here that the two highest targeted organizations as per the Verizon breach report were hospitality and retail. Think of when you go to a hotel. Okay, I travel once in a while. You go to a hotel and you give them your Marriott card or your Starwoods card or whatever. Think of the information that is on that, that card. We're not talking about credit cards and all that. Just your personal information, your information that has to do with your preferences. You know, where do you, what do you, where do you, you know, what floor do you like to stay on in a hotel? All that information, as well as all the information as to where you traveled. You know, I, I go to Chicago. All this information is all kept by these hotels, these, these hospitality type uh, organizations. And so, you know, between them and retail, I mean, when you think of retail, think of all the information you may give to a retail organization for, you know, any type of frequent buyer points, all these things. These are main big targets for attackers today. Not as much defense and government and the CIA and all these things because there's a, an abundance. I mean, if anybody stayed at a Wyndham hotel, anybody stayed at Wyndham hotels? First of all, anybody work for Wyndham because I'm going to say something really bad and they're going to get angry with me. <laughs> Don't stay at a Wyndham hotel, guys. These guys have been attacked over the last three years like 10 times. They've lost more data than any other hotel out there. So. Like these hotels, you know, they're these big chains of hotels. They're all susceptible to this type of risk, right? Um, some really quick cyber. I'm not going to get into this. A lot of these you've, you've heard about. Everybody's familiar with the Sony breach. Okay. Is everybody familiar with the fact that they were uh, hit over a dozen times? No? I mean, most people are aware of the big PlayStation thing, right? Sony continues. Uh, I think up until six months ago, they were hit again. They continually get hit. Um, the interesting thing is uh, the first hit they had was a few months after they laid off their entire security staff. <laughs> Speculations there, right? Just going to grab some water. Speculations are that, uh, you know, were the, uh, were the security people a little bit pissed off that they lost their jobs, that they went and attacked, right? That's a thought. People think that. Um, we had a lot of class action lawsuits. Uh, over 100 million records were lost. Uh, Sony claims that credit card information wasn't uh, part of this loss, but it was. Uh, University of South Carolina, 31,000 records lost. We had names, addresses, health records, financial information, 
Social security numbers, that was a fairly big one back in March. TripAdvisor, really not very much disclosure from TripAdvisor on this one, but there was quite a bit of information that was, that was stolen um, as part of this attack. Seacoast Radiology, this was an interesting one. For all of you aware of a Call of Duty, playing Call of Duty online, these guys attacked this, this organization, Seacoast Radiology, to get access to their pipe to be able to play Call of Duty. <laughs> Seriously. But in doing this, they exposed a bunch of data, radiology data, that Seacoast was managing. We had the ankle and foot center of Tampa. Lost quite a bit of data as well. I know this would kind of seem out there, ankle and foot clinic and all that, but you know, I'm just trying to show you that there's a good swath of organizations that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be breached, right? RSA, everybody familiar with RSA? Who here still uses RSA tokens? Who here has had their RSA tokens replaced? Good, good. Uh, Entrust sell them for like uh, six bucks cheaper per token, so I, they're probably making a killing on this. Um, the interesting thing with RSA, though, is RSA at the end of the day wasn't really the target. The target was who RSA do business with. And what we saw about a month after RSA, we saw the Lockheed hit, and it was basically using some of the stolen crypto information from RSA. Um, and, and RSA, another simple attack, uh, basically had a, uh, an embedded uh, flash object in an Excel spreadsheet sent out to a bunch of employees. They opened the Excel spreadsheet, launched the flash object, and get, got a backdoor installed to their machine. So not really complicated. It wasn't like an attacker breaking down a firewall or anything. So you remember when I was talking about security people want to throw firewalls all the time, you got to think bit more about how you protect the data because a firewall doesn't necessarily always protect you in these cases, right? HB Gary, um, another really interesting one as well. Uh, a lot of social engineering, uh, some low-level uh, attacks on a Linux box, and uh, you know a lot of unpatched systems got, got them access to this. Uh, Epsilon, another good one. Uh, they do uh, mailing lists for a bunch of different companies. Uh, you know, they, there was a lot of uh, lost there, names, email addresses, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a recent one. This just happened uh, on, on Christmas with Stratfor. Uh, they are a ge geopolitical analysis company, and they provide services to the gov various governments. Uh, they lost uh, anonymous uh, attack them. Uh, they're full of 75,000 names, addresses, credit card numbers, and so on and so forth, as well as 860,000 usernames, email addresses, MD5 hashes, all this good stuff. 50,000 of them, the addresses were .mil and .gov, so military and government addresses. And uh, the interesting thing is 212 of these addresses were from FBI and various three-letter spook-type organizations. So this is very valuable data, and this, this type of information could... Uh, could increase the, uh, the, the potential that um, organizations that have people undercover and people that are trying to stay anonymous, you know, their information could be lost. Um, interesting point there, CEO claims that the data was not encrypted and hackers made multiple attempts uh, and, and no one knew they were doing this, right? Really interesting, there was a group out there that analyzed the Strat4 attack and uh, basically they did a bit of, uh, they, because all this information was put up online by Anonymous, um, they were able to get the list that Anonymous posted of passwords and usernames and they did a bit of password cracking and some of the interesting, some of the information they pulled out was very interesting. Uh, follow on of 860,000 passwords that were leaked, 81,000 of those passwords were cracked in under five hours and you could see some of the first five passwords cracked. So organizations like Stratfor are still not enforcing very simple concepts like passwords. And how many times do you get that? Oh, you need to have a complex password. And you kind of roll your eyes back and say, oh, stop bothering me with this. I know about it. Well, obviously, a lot of big organizations really don't know about it, right? And you can see some of the, uh, the, the proper name ones here. Pretty scary, you know? We had Zappos that was just recently, uh, recently hacked as well. Uh, shoe shoe, uh, man, shoe uh, sales online, uh, part of Amazon. And uh, I just wanted to post this as a good example. This is where this data is ending up. So anybody familiar with Pastebin? 
you are, you should be start getting familiar with it because your, your data might be up here if, you, if your account's ever been hacked. This is a great uh, place that Anonymous and, and organizations like LulzSec um, love to post data that they steal. And for example, here you can see we've got, uh, this is the, um, an organization in the U.S. called InfraGuard. They're the community wing of the FBI. Uh, we got uh, email addresses, password hashes, usernames, and so on and so forth. Uh, for the Atlantic chapter of InfraGuard, posted up on Pastebin. Now, the interesting thing is, yeah, okay, it's just usernames and passwords. How many people do you think use the same usernames and passwords across other sites? So we have to understand that you may sit back and say, well, hey, it's just my InfraGuard account, or it's just my Yahoo account, or it's just my Facebook account. But think in your heads, and I'm not going to ask because... I know there's people in here that do this. How many places you share your passwords, right? So the two things that really could have helped here, and we're not going to talk about firewalls and all this stuff here and architecting networks. Really, the two things in all these cases that could have really protected the, the data that was there. Now, let's not talk about whether or not we could protect from a hack. Hack's a hack. It's going to happen at one point in time. But in, in terms of the data, if they had encryption on any of that data, and if they had some type of monitoring of the data leaving the network, yeah, they may have been hacked, but none of this data would have left the organization. And if it did, it would have been useless to the attacker. And a lot of this comes from the security person being the data owner. You know, the security person taking the decision, or I shouldn't say being the data owner, but the security, the security person pretending they're the data owner, making the decisions for the data owner. And at the end of the day, the only person that owns the data is the business owner, the data owner. And the security person's there to facilitate controls around that data. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of those attacks, let's, really, let's, let's look at uh, an understanding of these attacks a little bit more. So the face of cybercrime. And I don't know if anybody re rem remembers any of these uh, people. I mean, things like um, uh, the Melissa virus, I love you virus, remember those? Well, there's specific people that architected these, these attacks. And what we're seeing more and more um, is we're seeing a lot of anonymity here. You know, it's, it's no, not necessarily one specific person. And we've seen this because over the last year, we've seen a lot of organizations, you know, you'll see these things, the FBI or Interpol takes down this house and they get this guy and he's like, oh, he's the mastermind of Anonymous. And he's you know, he's one person. And like I mentioned before, Anonymous is not necessarily a specific group of people. It's a concept. Anybody can attack a server and say they're anonymous, right? Uh, there was just recently that, uh, I think it was two days ago, Anonymous, wh who, somebody who said they were anonymous went out and said, we're going to attack Facebook, right? And Anonymous has just come back and said, no, that's not us. So it's, it's really a concept at the end of the day, right? So don't worry, they're not going to attack Facebook. You're, you're safe. We have uh, people like Max Butler here. Um, this guy is, uh, <laughs> you'd think he was a bit in ingenious, but he, at the end of the day, th this guy was, uh, uh, he served some time for stealing a whole bunch of credit cards. And then he got out of prison and he said to himself, hey, you know what, I don't want to get caught for stealing credit cards, so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to steal them, I'm going to make them available to people. And I'm going to make money off that. So he set up this underground thing called the Carter's Market. Well, lo and behold, of course, the FBI were watching this guy. They caught him, and basically, he got another 13 years. Uh, he got 13 years uh, and, and was ordered to pay under, just under $30 million in restitution. So this is the, the type of guy we've been seeing in the past years. There's uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Anybody familiar with this guy? TJ Maxx winners. Remember that whole, piece, that whole scandal? Uh, the scandal that brought PCI. Anybody familiar with PCI here? PCI is the legislation around protecting credit cards, right? So this guy, uh, who actually worked for the Secret Service, ironically was caught by the Secret Service, uh, he stole uh, just a, over 170 million credit card numbers. Um, and they caught him, and uh, he's serving 20 years in federal prison. And uh, it was funny because he was trying to kind of stay under the radar, but he would go out and buy like five Rolex watches at a time and things like that. And they ended up, uh, they searched his parents' house because he was living in kind of like a, a bit of a dive in Miami. They searched his parents' house and they found um, 
uh, one of those big uh, oil drums buried in his parents' backyard with something like $20 million in it. It's insane, right? Uh, we have hacker groups like Anonymous. Uh, you know, the important, the important thing to note with Anonymous is their hacks actually expose data. Like I said, they're not necessarily in it to make money. They're in it to expose the data. They're in it, they're in it to ex expose people like law enforcement and so on and so forth. We have state-sponsored attacks. Anybody here familiar with Stuxnet? So Stuxnet was that attack that was, uh, that was perpetrated against, uh, well, it was perpetrated against many people, but really the, the target was uh, the Iranian government to bring down their nuclear uh, enrichment program. But these, the, inter the interesting thing with that attack and these other ones is they have been proven that they were facilitated by state-sponsored uh, organizations. So, for example, the Chinese and the, and the Ukrainians uh, are organizations that uh, are involved in a lot of these attacks. It's lo a lot of cloak and dagger secret stuff, but it actually does happen. So the motive of the attacker, well, we have political and, and or military objectives. Uh, we have uh, access to personal information. We have economic objectives, technical objectives, critical infrastructure objectives. In many cases, if not the main goal of the attack, personal information is leaked. So we talked about that attack with the Call of Duty guys, right? So that wasn't necessarily the initial, the initial attack, but it ended up leaking data anyway. And, and what, what we're seeing from a targeted attack, uh, you know, we make the mistake of thinking the attacks are transient, whereas the attackers want to stay in our systems as long as they can. Um, where we look at things like economy of scale, automation, that's where malware comes into play. I can attack a lot more people with an automated malware type of attack than trying to break down the doors of a firewall into a network. And again, you know, the, the, the goal here is stealth, right? You know, we want to, uh, the attacker wants to get into your network and he wants to basically get as much data as he can, stay there as long as he can. And the, the big thing that we're seeing now is attackers are being able to conduct attacks and mimic legitimate traffic on your network. So, you know, if, if I'm a, a security guy and I'm looking at data on your network um, go by and it's regular web traffic, what if an attacker was using the same type of web traffic? So, you know, for the technical people, HTTP traffic or HTTPS traffic, standard web traffic, what if the attacker was exfiltrating data using that same protocol? You know, you might not be aware of that because you're, you're, you're constantly looking for things that are out of place and you have such a large amount of web traffic that it's impossible to pick out. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I'm just rambling on here. You know, uh, you know the focus is going to be about data and the benefit to the attacker, right? So why is it so hard to catch them? Well, again, like I mentioned, we have traffic that is running over HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, you know, there, it's traffic that no, we're not necessarily set up to be able to uh, look into and possibly pick out attackers. Browser-based attacks are becoming more and more popular. We're, they're using, um, they're using uh, issues within the browser, vulnerabilities within the browser to be able to hijack your machine and, and conduct attacks using the links that you click as opposed to breaking through that firewall, right? Uh, we have a lot of legacy apps on our network. Uh, we have weak application security. Uh, you know, organizations with like, like Bell Line, for example, we have such a large footprint, it's a lot, and, and you know, we don't necessarily have 10 million security people to, to work on this, right? Zero day attacks. So these are the attacks that uh, that occur. Um, these are the vulnerabilities that come out, and uh, you know organizations are not aware of these these vulnerabilities in their products, and uh, you know the attackers find out and they, they don't have enough time to uh, to release a patch, for example. Things like uh, PDFs and Word, being able to pepper those files with possible uh, malware. So if I open up an, an Adobe file, an Adobe Acrobat file and I'm not running the most newest Adobe Reader, um, 
there might be some JavaScript code, for example, that's embedded in the PDF that may launch, send me to a website and bring down some malware. And I think I'm running close on time, right? Yes. So really, there's two types of attacks. You're going to have attacks against your network, your applications and your systems, and you're going to have attacks specifically against users. So these are the attacks where you get that. Uh, have any, anybody here got the fake AV that pops up and says, your machine's infected, click here and we'll uninfect your machine? Well, by clicking that app, you're actually initiating the attack, right? And, and, and they didn't necessarily have to break into your firewall to do that. And by clicking that link, you might go over to some site in the Ukraine, you might go over to some site in China and bring down a malware, malware payload that gets installed in your machine. So you're really the one who's initiated the attack on your own machine. So these types of attacks are very, very popular these days because, again, it's, it's an attack of scale, automation. I don't have to focus my energy on one specific network. So what the organization, the attack organizations are going to do is they're going to conduct some type of reconnaissance to build their targeted attack. They're going to find out information about who specifically they should target. That's where we get up this big spear phishing attack, right? Well, if I'm going to attack Dalhousie students, for example, I may send them an email about uh, student loans. And, and, and that will be specifically targeted to Dalhousie students. And you know, maybe I hit 5,000 students, maybe 100, 100 students open that email. That's still 100 out of 5,000, and I didn't have to do any more work to get there. Right? Once they've found their people and they've sent the email, they're going to conduct their initial breach. They're going to get into your network, whether it's through your network, whether it's using one of these exploits that we talked about. They're going to establish some type of backdoor. So they're going to put more malware onto your system. And if your system doesn't offer them anything, they're going to do what we call in the, in the, in the business, they're going to try to pivot. They're going to move laterally on the network. They're going to use your access to gain access to other systems. They're going to, at that point, establish some sort of connection with what we call a command and control system. So that's a system that's out there on the internet, whether, and I, I pick on China and the Ukraine, but those are the main countries where we're seeing these attacks coming from. They're going, to, they're going to connect back up to a command and control system in, in one of these other countries. And from there, they can then control your PC. They can send more malware down to you. They can create accounts. They can take screenshots of your machine. Uh, they, can they can pretty much do anything to your PC once they have that malware on there. And at that point, they're going to exfiltrate the data they want to send off, off your machine. They're going to send it all off to a staging server somewhere and they're going to go pick it up later on. And at that point, they'll do other things they can do to maintain persistence. They'll delete logs on your machine, uh, anything they can do so that you won't recognize that they're there. And of course, I mentioned before Pastebin, at that point, you know, if, if they're anonymous, for example, they'll take all that great data they found and they'll make it public. So how do I protect myself? I only have a few slides left. Sorry, I, I've been up since 4 o'clock, this anonymous thing. Yeah, let me just say they're not really nice people. I got up at 4 this morning when my team called me, and I'm kind of going on like 20 cups of coffee and no food, so <laughs> it's fun. Um, so how do I protect myself? Well, encryption. Make sure you understand where your data is and what it is and, and how important it is to your organization, and start to apply some type of encryption. Now, it doesn't have to be a compliance thing. It just means you, you want to make sure your, your data is safe. So, and, and I know, that, I know the, uh, the speaker before me mentioned that rest and emotion. That's key, right? So you want to find out where your databases are that store your sensitive data, and you want to make sure that if the data is sensitive, it, it's encrypted, right, on the database. And then in motion, as the data tra transits your network, um, if it's sensitive, it should be encrypted. So, no more FTP and Telnet, and I know you're all freak out, oh, I have to use Telnet. No more FTP, you, you know, SFTP, secure versions of, of file transfer are out there. You replace them and it means that your data is transited uh, securely. Um, look at visibility of your network from a data loss per prevention uh, perspective. So there are tools and systems out there that can actually monitor data as it's leaving your network. So if you specifically want to see credit card information, 
there are ways to be able to put systems in there that you can actually monitor your network to see if credit card information is leaving your network. That could be potentially uh, an issue with somebody in your organization just emailing stuff, but it could also be an attacker offloading that data. Architect your network. So again, the layering thing. You want to still add the firewalls and the proxy servers and all that good stuff, but really make sure you keep in mind um, the emphasis on protecting the data, not the infrastructure around it. Update your inventory. This is a big one at Bell Lion. We have so much legacy gear from all the, you know, MT&T and NBTEL and, and Islandtel and all this. When we amalgamated years ago, you know, there's so much disparate systems. One of the things we've been doing over years is, is basically trying to eliminate legacy gear and make sure our inventory is correct. If you don't know what you're protecting, you're going to have a problem, right? Uh, inspect and secure your DNS. So this is another one. If your DNS information is taken hostage by malware, if I go and type in google.com and I'm, my DNS is not what's actually resolving that and it's some Russian DNS, google.com could may not be google.com real, really, right? I may be resolving that to, for example, a server in Russia and then I'll, I'll be getting potentially a fake site, right? So you want to make sure that your, your DNS is inspected and you want to make sure that your records can't be tampered with. Take care of your web app. So this goes without saying, if you're going to deploy a web application, ensure that it is securely built and assessed and that you have proper um, security within your life cycle of devel development of your applications. Geoblocking is another one. Uh, a lot of organizations are getting into saying, well, look, I don't do business with China. So, or the Ukraine, for example, I'm just going to block all that address space from coming into my network. It's an option. Protect your endpoint. Again, AV is not going to solve all your problems, but you probably still want to have AV on there. Patch your systems and so on and so forth. Proxy your internet traffic. You do not want to be sending your users out to the internet directly. If you inspect their traffic as it's going out to the internet, you may be able to potentially catch people trying to go to Russia and China and so on and so forth. Uh, response plan, obviously that goes without saying. You know, you want to look for things like, you know, malware, who's targeting you? What are they after? These are all the questions you want to ask that your malware provider or your antivirus provider is not necessarily answering for you. Yes, your antivirus provider will provide updates to signatures, but they don't necessarily answer those questions. Yeah, I got malware and I was able to get rid of it because of an, an update to my McAfee or Symantec or Trend, but really what happened at that point? Did it get on my network? Did it, uh, did it exfiltrate data? You know, these are important questions you have to figure out a way to answer. Education within your organization obviously goes without saying. I'm just going through this because I'm going to get kicked off the stage soon there. And that's pretty much all I have. So. Uh, I don't know if do I have time for questions. A few questions? Anybody? Everybody's prepared for anonymous. I was walking down Goddard Street a couple like a couple months ago, and there was a bunch of anonymous flyers on um, telephone poles all the way down Goddard Street. I don't know. Kind of kind of creepy, isn't it? No questions. All right, well, thanks for having me.